Now let me begin with what might be a, a slightly jarring thing to hear in uh, towards the end of September. Uh, but we all know the story, well-known book, A Christmas Carol. <laughs> Told you it might feel a little jarring at the, at the end of September. Not ready for that yet, no thank you. Uh, but this incredibly famous book written by incredibly famous author Charles Dickens, uh, which has been made into so many film and drama versions, I, I don't know how people still keep watching them over and over. We'll watch a new one for the educated among us, the Muppets version. For others, it's all kinds of versions. But there's a reason this book is famous. There's a reason we love this story. Um, and it's because a great change occurs in a person. Uh, our main character, Ebenezer Scrooge, is this grumpy, miserly, don't want to talk to anyone, just money-focused man. Just has all, all that he needs and all that he wants uh, and doesn't have time for other people, just wants to gather all this money and kind of get on with working and uh, he's a very cold-hearted person. And of course, I'm, I don't think I'm giving away any spoiler alerts here because if nobody's read it or seen it, and you, I don't know where you have been for your whole life, but he has this experience during the night when these ghosts of past, present and future come and show him his past and, and what, what will happen should he not change his ways. And so because of this evening, because of this experience, he wakes up the next day and he's, he's transformed into this incredibly warm-hearted, generous man. And, and the, the men, that he, the charity men that he turned away at the start, he bumps into them again. He, he told them to go off. Now, I won't say all the famous lines, but he, he told them to go off and, uh, and he didn't want to give them anything. And now he kind of leans in and whispers because it's such a big amount. He doesn't want anyone to hear. And the man looks astonished at this change that's literally happened overnight in this man's life. Now, why do I start with that? Well, when we look at these passages, uh, when we come into chapters 8 and 9, uh, we're, we're considering giving, aren't we? We're thinking about uh, uh, giving of finances, giving of relief to other people. And you would almost say this is a gospel generosity that Paul is encouraging here. Because what Paul is saying is that what happens when we come to Christ is there's a transformation that occurs in us. We change. And something in us wants to give towards, give to others, give to other believers, give to other brothers and sisters, and to be generous with what we have, whatever that might be. However large or small that might be, a change occurs because our great Saviour has been unthinkably, unspeakably generous towards us and has saved us. And so this, and has changed us from within. And so this makes us want to serve and to give and to follow Christ in this way. The gospel makes us generous in that way. It transforms us and changes our hearts. And if you're already very generous, it makes you more generous than you were before. And Paul is calling here the Corinthians to, to do this, to be that generous church because of the gospel. And he does this by reminding them of three examples. So he points them to three examples to encourage them to give out of what they have and give to the needs of others, particularly the needs of other churches. And so the first example he gives is the Macedonians. He says, remember the Macedonians, verses 1 to 7, if you look at those verses together. He begins by saying, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now just stop there a moment, the grace of God that has been given. What's interesting when you go through these verses is you see that that word for grace is used, which can mean grace or favour, a kind of, it can mean a kind of gift that is given. And the gift that was given to the churches in Macedonia was basically this generous spirit, this generous giving that was given to them. It's interesting, one of the commentaries I was reading, which I find very helpful going through 2 Corinthians, he says, it's interesting in churches, isn't it, when you say people desire particular kinds of gifts. You know, you look at Corinth, look at 1 Corinthians, there were certain gifts that were being elevated over. He says, if only more of us would pray, Lord, give me more generosity with my money. Let that be the gift that you give me. And let that be the way that I serve. He says, so often our attitude is we want the, the upfront gifts are ones that are look quite exciting or sort of interesting. We don't often think of it in that way. This is, God has gifted this person with this generous heart. And this is what he gave to those people in Macedonia. And we know that it was a real gift. 
uh, because it came in verse 2 in a severe test of affliction. Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. This wasn't the rich folks dishing out the cash. This wasn't Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and all the famous and rich people of the world. These were people who had uh, hit extreme poverty. It's often been said about folks in the world that sometimes the poorest can actually be the most, uh, the most generous to those around them. In this test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity in their part. You know, these people, uh, these churches would include the likes of the Thessalonians, who when Paul wrote to them in chapter 1 said, We knew you were genuine, because when the word came, you received it in the midst of much affliction. You see, these, these Christians here had become Christians when it wasn't convenient and easy to be a Christian. So that's, that's how we knew, because when you became Christians, it actually invited more difficulty into your life. But yet you embraced Jesus anyway. And they gave at a time when it wasn't convenient for them to do so. You know, sometimes we can have that attitude. I've, I've seen it in my, my own life. And so I think, of, if I have a, once I have a bit more, once I get a bit more, then I'll start. I'll start, I'll start giving more. These, these people did not have that attitude. They said, well, we don't have much, but we want to give of what we have. And, and there's this incredible generosity that had come because of the change that had occurred in their hearts. Paul says in verse 3 that they gave according to their means, as I can testify, but beyond their means of their own accord. So they sort of gave in a way that they couldn't, really afford it. It was beyond their means and what they had. Uh, which is an incredible generosity, especially for people who just have so little. And the, the next phrase is fantastic. Verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints. Begging, please, Paul, take our money. How often do we hear that? You know, and, and, and send relief to the brothers and sisters that need it. They wanted to help. They wanted to do more. And I can imagine Paul being there thinking, even, even Paul at this point was really thinking, are you, are you sure? <laughs> you know, do you have enough yourselves? You've already given according to your means. Can you really, really do more? Uh, but they wanted to serve in this particular way. That's such a challenge to us today, I think, and a challenge to us in our society and in the, 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 the lives that we live. I find this incredibly convicting this week. So how much of my expectations um, of, of these things related to money and security and all this kind of thing, how much of it come out of a gospel attitude or how much of it comes out of the world? How much am I just shaped by the culture around me and understanding what I need or what I think I should have? And I think the same should be asked of all of us. Uh, what do we value the most? Do our values line up with the gospel or do they just line up with the culture in which we finds ourselves and there's so much danger in that isn't there the danger of desiring wealth you know Paul warns against that in other places doesn't he that uh, it can lead you into many dangers and snares and some people says make shipwreck of their faith because they desire riches and can lead to all kinds of entanglements and he says but godliness with contentment is great gain but these churches uh, had sh had shown their love for Christ, had shown the change in their love for their brothers and sisters by giving uh, to these people. He said that, first of all, they had given themselves to the Lord. And I think that's important, isn't it? That was important. It, it was to the Lord, then to Paul. So they gave themselves to the Lord and they felt the Lord is leading us in this way, so we need to give. And and this is this is so important to Paul in these chapters. Is Paul's He's advising and he's saying, some things, but he doesn't want to coerce them. He doesn't want to bully them. He doesn't want to manipulate them into giving too much uh, or, or just giving sort of, oh, out of guilt or because Paul told us to. It's like we, we want there to be a spirit, Holy Spirit change there that makes them want to, to give more. Just a few years ago, I remember sitting in a, uh, where was I? I was in a church and there was a particular Christian ministry, a really great Christian ministry actually, and I was sitting at their conference and there was this point that came along that none of us were expecting. We're all sitting there. And it was sort of like, it, it was the, here comes the hard sell you know, kind, of, kind of thing. And they were pretty intense about it. You know, they, they were saying, that here's, oh, we need this money, we need this, we need all this kind of stuff. And then some 
one of them put on some worship music on their phone, which is up the back of the room, which I thought was a bit weird. But they, they, and then the kind of all these things were passed out, and and it was like people were sort of filling it in because they felt they had to, rather than because of. Now it's a great ministry. The one obviously I won't mention it, but the, it's a great ministry, and they do a lot of good work. But I was just sitting there going, something about this feels coerced. It feels almost bullied, and the person sitting next to me just did this <laughs> for the whole for the whole time because they thought I don't whatever the case might be. And in contrast to that, I remember hearing, actually at the start of lockdown, one of the things that came into my mind was, I wonder how missionary organisations are going to do in the midst of all this. And, and uh, have you ever heard of Paul Washer? But he was on Heart Cry Missionary Society, and, and they base all their, uh, their attitude to raising funds on George Mueller's sort of way of kind of praying and, and, and seeing what comes. And that's not everybody's calling. Not everyone has to do that at all. But it was just, it was just counterintuitive the way I think where he did this video and set out and said, look, some of you may be struggling financially at this point. So he says, I want to tell you two things. He says, first of all, you need to provide for your family. He says, because if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. Secondly, you need to provide for your local church. So you can do that. Um, but if you don't have any left over after that for us, don't sin by giving it to us. Just like, what an attitude. What a brilliant attitude. Because he says, you, got, you, can't, you can't take away from those things to give to us. And he said, let me read our constitution. And the constitution says it's written into their bylaws that no person will be manipulated or coerced or bullied into giving financially to this. And he says, look, if God wants to use us, he'll provide it. It's fine. And if he's done with us, he doesn't need us anymore. We'll close. We'll, we'll switch off the lights. We'll all go home and do something else. You know? And I thought, wow, what an attitude. Now, that's not everybody's calling. But it's refreshing to hear that. And Because he, he doesn't want anyone to be bullied or coerced. Or sort of like he, the kingdom needs our missionary thing, or we're all going to collapse. The whole thing's going to fall apart. And you know, he says, "No, nope, God's got it under control." Uh, that was that was that was great to hear. What a wonderful thing to hear. And uh, it's it's important that that giving comes from within, and and this giving was to other places. It was to other churches and other uh, believers. When uh, Dixon and our and uh, Andy as well and our our Monday night preaching group, one of the guys that was doing one of the videos had said he, as a young pastor, he'd taken this passage for um, his giving Sunday, as in giving to his own local church. He was then deflated because it was all about getting the passage in context. He felt a little bit deflated when he realized that the passage was all about gathering collection to send to other churches. <laughs> and he thought, I might have to rethink my passage here, you know. And it was, it was this is a generosity that goes beyond our own, our own uh, place, our own church. But it's important for Christians to do this. And he saw it in uh, the, the, the Macedonians. And it's important for us today, isn't it? We thought about on Thursday, giving to other places, 20 schemes, Clear Brody, these kind of things. And it's important for us to continue to do that as well. And sometimes we need the example of others, like the Corinthians needed the Macedonians example, in order to, to spur us on. And to do that when we see other people doing it. It's one of the reasons I've often found like, Christian biographies and stories of church history really helpful to, to challenge me in a certain aspect of my life. And sometimes we need that, just like the Corinthians, Paul saying, look at the Macedonians who have so little, but have given according to their means and actually beyond their means. They have so little, but they've given. And even for us as a church, we know we, know we, we don't have all the resources in the world. But we want to keep being generous to others, other churches, other missionaries, other societies, uh, and, and be a blessing to others uh, uh, as well as we seek to give. But he says, remember the Macedonians. And secondly, he actually says, remember yourselves. And that might seem like a strange point, but uh, th this is what I think Paul, Paul can really do here. It's because I'm saying he's not given a command, but he's saying, you yourselves were going on well in this at one point. Can it, can it, what happened? What changed? If we look further down at the verses, uh, he's, in verses 6 he says, Accordingly we urged Titus that as he had acted, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. So it seems that there was a time, and further down actually in the other verses, we read, sorry, I have to keep reading 11 to 15 as well. Uh, but I'll start with, yeah, I'll start with 6 and 7. There was a time when it seemed that they had set in their hearts and minds to give in this particular way. 
it Paul says whether it was last year or, or so on, uh, that they, they, had, they had set their hearts to do this. But it seemed, they seemed to have let it go, seemed to have kind of stopped with that same generous attitude that they had before. In fact, the point where verse 7, he says, as you excel in everything. So, so they, they have their strengths as well, the church in Corinth. You know, every church has its strengths and weaknesses. None of us are perfect. Some, we all have areas we could strengthen and improve. And he says, you're, you're good in a lot of things. You have a lot of strengths. I want you to excel in this also. I want you to, in this act of grace as well, pursue this and do this more. And this is something that perhaps they have slipped on, let go on. You look down in verse 10. In this matter, I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. And you see, it's both there, isn't it? Again, notice Paul's concern about the heart. Notice Paul's concern about the desire. He says you were doing it, and you're doing it most importantly because you desired to do it. It was a God-given thing. It was a God-given generosity. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. So as we've seen, there was a sense in which they probably let this go a little bit. They'd let this slip in some way. And now Paul's saying, we need you to start doing that again. And it's easy for us to do that as people, I think, as Christians. Sometimes, and it's not just in areas of giving, it can be in other areas of our Christian life where we start well and then something, we get distracted, we get interrupted, and we begin to just let things slip. It could be in our personal Bible reading and prayer. I mean, how easy is it for, for that to be lost in some way? Or we kind of look back and think, what, what happened there? Or, or in, in fighting some sin in our life. And we look back and think, I'm afar. What, what's happened? I've been, you know, lured in by this again and it seems for the Corinthians this desire to give was there but he says I want you to, to get back to doing it to get back to being generous towards your brothers and sisters in Christ and I finish doing it so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your complete night of what you have so there's a readiness but they're not actually actually doing it and as I've said before what matters to Paul the most is the heart behind uh, the given, if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. <coughs> Paul's not giving them the numbers. You know, he's not giving them digits and saying, this is how much I expect you to give because I know you guys are pretty you know, wealthy or whatever. He's just, he's just saying it's about the heart behind this giving and I want you to desire that. You were doing this well before, what happened? He's saying that they should give when they can and according to what they have. It's not a wonderful thing, you know, according to what you have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need that there may be fairness. He does acknowledge that. He does acknowledge that much, that probably this church in Corinth are actually probably wealthier than the ones in Macedonia. Uh, at this point, he says, you do have an abundance. And so you should supply, supply their need that there may be fairness because it's not just a case of one of the churches gives loads and loads and the other church doesn't have to. No, it's like we're to relieve one another and work with one another and give to one another. And in that sense, there's fairness. It's not the one church are carrying all the financial weight and everyone else is, is doing it. Um, but obviously some churches are poorer, some are wealthier. Uh, and they should give according to what they have. And sometimes that, in a sense, I think can be a gift to, to wealthier Christians in churches. A, a gift to be the giver, almost. You know, Sometimes people, I've heard people say that um, there was a time where they wished they could have been the person overseas. Or they wished they could have been the person uh, taking the gospel to those kind of places. But it just it didn't happen for whatever reason. But later realizing, I can't go myself, but I can give to those who do. And in a way that other people can't. And that's a wonderful gift. That's a wonderful um, encouragement to those people. Uh, and not to be looked down on. To use wealth in order to bless uh, other brothers and sisters in Christ. And they are to supply the need of others so that no one would be lacking. And this I think is the reference to Exodus 16 there. 
Uh, he said, as it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. The point of the thing being that nobody, when, when God was raining down manna uh, in the wilderness, nobody had any lack. Everyone had what they needed. And I think that's the point he's getting across here, that the churches should be giving to one another, relieving one another when they can, how they can, with however much they can, so that every person will have what they need. And that might differ from place to place and church to church. But he says in that way, as God provides uh, to every church and they give to each other, he says no one is lacking in what they need. No one's hoarding it up like some of them were doing with the bread and sort of trying, trying to hang on to it, but being able to give uh, as to each as, as to they need, as to, according to their needs. So he's actually, in a funny kind of way, rem- reminding them of their own example last year or a year ago or whenever that was. And saying, remember that, get back to that. And that desire that you had. Start giving again. Show that generosity again. Maybe there's something, it might not be given, there might be something in your life this morning you think, I need to get back to that. I need um, God's help in this again. I need to find that discipline again in my Christian life. So finally, uh, having said he looks to the example of the Macedonians and then to their own example. If you're wondering, well, hang on, he skipped a verse. That was deliberate because I was saving the most important example to the end to remember the example of Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate example for us. Paul points them to the example of Jesus and specifically Jesus giving himself for us so that we could be saved. You see, our giving and our lives in general as Christians are built upon the gospel, are motivated by the gospel, are motivated by God's grace in our lives. It's not legalism, it's not law, um, although God's law is important, but it's not kind of been coerced and guilted into doing things. We're motivated by God's grace and by the gospel. That's part of the beauty of Christianity, isn't it? God gives us these desires by spirit flows out of the grace of God in our lives, the gospel. Look at verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. You see what Paul's doing there when he's been talking about giving and generosity and all those things. He takes the work of Christ and he shows how Christ has made us rich beyond our wildest dreams but not in the way that the world thinks about being rich beyond your wildest dreams it's a sense in which Jesus gave to us so much and and he in his grace he has made us rich but you see Jesus became poor so that we might become rich I'm just thinking about that for a moment I was astonished looking at this again preparing the sermon and just thinking about what this really means. What did it mean that Jesus became poor? What did it mean? Well, it's because Jesus, has, Jesus was rich in the right sense. Jesus himself is the eternal son of God. Jesus himself enjoyed perfect fellowship and harmony with the Father, with the Spirit. God himself dwelled for eternity in perfect joy, perfect happiness, perfect peace. And Jesus stepped in to this fallen creation and many of these became nothing. He became born as a baby, lived a normal-ish life, suffered and died. He was barely recognised when he came, wasn't he? Let's think about that at Christmas, that he came and was born to a stable, a bunch of animals around him. Nobody noticed. The wise men went looking in the palace because they thought, well, if he's a king, he must be here. But that wasn't the kind of king Jesus was. Jesus came in poverty he, he made himself nothing. And just to help us consider some of this, I've got some passages from the New Testament. John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. This is who Christ is. The one through whom all things were made. The Creator. And yet further down in that one, we'll say the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. 
Consider Philippians 2, which we thought about on Thursday at the meeting. That Christ, who though he was in the form of God, or the NIV very helpfully says, very in, being in very nature God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So he's in the form of God, but took the form of a servant. Be born in the likeness of men and be found in human form. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Hebrews 2, it's already described Jesus as the one through whom he created all things and who is the exact imprint of his nature and the radiance of his glory and is now seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. But he was the one who firstly, for a little while, it says, was made lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of death that he might taste death for everyone. See, never has there been such an act of self-sacrifice because of who he is and then what he became. Became poor, He he was nothing so that we might be saved. And there never will be another example of it again. He made himself nothing and poor when he came to the earth. He went from the glory to the dirt, to the dust, and then suffered and died for us. Because we had sinned, because we had done what was evil, because we needed a saviour. And in Jesus, in his loving, indescribable generosity, gave himself for us, that we might be rich. (coughs) You could be the poorest person on the planet, but if you have Jesus, you're far richer than everybody else. Don't let the prosperity preachers tell you otherwise because they they will try. Uh, But in Christ, we have eternal riches in glory. Something far greater than a few few coins, a few pennies here and there, a few nice few cars, or whatever the case may be. Because we will forever be with him in that place. There will be no sin, no mourning, no pain and tears and sickness in his new creation forever in his presence forever uh, where there are riches at his right hand pleasures forevermore it's just uh, preparing this as i was like i just don't have words to describe this to you no, 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 this poor preacher anyway we, we, what glory you know, what giving what sacrifice the lord of the universe became poor so that we might become rich we might be saved We might have eternity with him. See, when you you can see why we need to say that, don't we? That we need to say the gospel motivates us. Because when we look at ourselves or when we look around us and we just think about that, we just it just becomes about all the wrong things. But when we look at the gospel, when we, we consider Christ, we consider who he is and where he is now and what's to come, it's like it takes all your attention off of that, doesn't it? You go, oh yeah, it's an incredible saviour. I want to give myself to him and do what I can for him. He gave himself for us so that we might become rich. He's our saviour and he's our example for how we are to live our lives. So for us, brothers and sisters, let us give all to him. And by giving all to him, in turn, give what we can to others, brothers and sisters in Christ and Bless people outside of the church and see people saved so that God may be exalted. The gospel preached and God's church built and established in this place and to the ends of the earth.